Hello again, Cinema Appreciation students. I hope you're doing fantastically well. Greetings from Los Angeles. Behind me is Grau Min's or Man's Chinese Theater. Considered to be the ultimate place to actually have movie previews for major blockbuster films. Right in front are the Hollywood Walk of Fame with the stars that you can actually go with more than 1,200 stars to date, including The Rock, um, going all the way back to Marilyn Monroe. We have George Lucas right behind me, R2-D2, C-3PO. Um, it's kind of a very cool walk if you are a fan of film. Today we are talking about dramatization, specifically on how we actually get people to believe they're in another world, through costumes, through makeup, and through settings, and that's where we'll begin today. They say the clothes make the man, but in Hollywood, they often tell his story. Or hers. These are the top ten movie wardrobes of all time. Kicking us off at number ten, we've always loved marveling at the wild, creative, and often bizarre takes on the future that costume designers have given us in sci-fi. Consider Star Wars' pseudo-Japanese Western military chic, Blade Runner's neo-noir cultural potpourri, and The Matrix's iconic Leatherfest, or Metropolis' beautiful android, Tron's glowing jumpers, and Barbarella's sexy spacesuits. And who could forget the bizarro fashion scapes of Dune and A Clockwork Orange? However, for our first pick, we're giving it to the fifth element. Unbelievable! Designed by the legendary Jean-Paul Gaultier, is there a sci-fi character with better wardrobe than Ruby Rod? But it's not just that. There's Lilu's iconic white straps, Gary Oldman's frigid turtlenecks, and that blue opera alien's awesome whatever that is. Gautier personally designed over 900 costumes for the film, from the stars to the extras, with an eye towards playing with and against notions of sexuality and gender. It's one of the coolest, kookiest, most comic con sci-fi wardrobes out there, which is why it starts off our list. Now here at Cinefix, we watch a lot of movies, and sure, most of them are English language films, but we like to make an effort to keep it global too. So for our number nine, we want to give our appreciation to some excellent films that came from beyond our American borders. And from France, that might be the costuming from the cook that feeds his wife and her lover. From Japan, it might be from Ran. From Hong Kong, it might be in the mood for love. Or from China, it might be Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. But for our pick, we're pretty torn between Yi Mu Shang's Hero and House of Flying Daggers. These are both fantastic films. Hero tells the story of the first Chinese emperor and an overthrow plot that tried to take place. Chin Shi Wang Ni. Call it obvious or over the top, but to our eye, the use of colored costuming in these two films is absolutely poetic. With Hero dividing up its vignettes into primary colors and House of Flying Daggers weaving them fluidly into the story. Both were based on Wu Xing color theory. Both were designed by Iniwata, and both are pretty much equally incredible. We have to pick just one, but we'll go and with both Hero. Both were choreographed like, by Yu Wu Ping. But we're not happy about it. There's one thing Hollywood's always been the best at. It's being cool. So for our number eight, we want to single out the films that made us all want to burn our closets and deck out like a goddamn badass. We're talking about Shaft, Kill Bill, Fight Club, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. We're talking about James Dean and Rebel Without a Cause. We're talking about Brando and The Wild One. But if you really want to talk Brando and cool, look no further than A Streetcar Named Desire. Hi, it's our sister. Yes. Oh, hi. Hey, where's the woman? That's right, it's pretty much just a sweaty t-shirt here, but no one has ever worn one like this before. Thanks to designer Lucinda Ballard, Brando took an afterthought and turned it into the definitive bad boy look. God damn, was he cool. Next up at number seven, we're going from cool to hip. We're looking at the offbeat take on trends. And maybe that's Big Lebowski's slacker chic or Annie Hall's androgynous digs, but if we're thinking hip, we've got to tip our pastel colored hats to the king, Wes Anderson. And that could be this Robkin fashion from Grand Budapest Hotel or the miniature tweed of Fantastic Mr. Fox, but instead our pick goes to the immense character captured by the costumes in the Royal Tenenbaums. It's made of cockle I know. All custom made and brilliantly detailed. Take Margot's look, for example. It's sloppy, yet precisely chosen. The same thing she's always worn, wealthy yet dated, stuck in the era of her family's heyday with a little sportiness to tie her into the rest of the family. Were the Tenenbaums the original hipsters? Probably not. But they came up just on the cusp, and they're our favorite hipster family yet. 
At number six, we were bound to get here eventually. If we're ranking movie fashion, we can't ignore the period piece. That's right, as far as the Academy Awards are concerned, the only good costumes are period costumes. The Baroque, big bustled hoop dresses of the Victorian era. Don't get us wrong, we love the wardrobes from Shakespeare in Love, Titanic, Gigi, Amadeus, Anna Karenina, and Marie Antoinette. Hell, even the outfits from Cleopatra will knock your socks off if you want to look a bit farther back. And we know we're missing a ton of mentions. It's really hard for us not to pick on with a win, but for our number six, there's nothing quite so lavish as the bajillion and one massive gowns from Elizabeth the Golden Age. Tell us, I fear neither him, nor his priests, nor his armies. And to those we say, holy shit, talk about excess. If costumes were special effects, these would be the transformers of dresses. Designed by Alexander Byrne, the costumes took a more haute couture look at the Elizabethan garb than any other period film, playing with the performative aspects of the clothes, their sexiness and their emotionality. Of course, not all period pieces come from an era where men rode horses and women came with a dowry. The 20th century is ripe with opportunities for an incredible wardrobe. The 20s, both Great Gatsby's, the 30s, Bonnie and Clyde, Chinatown, and The Godfather, the snazzy cross-century progression of Malcolm X, the different sides of the 70s from Days and Confused, American Hustle, and Saturday Night Fever, even the 90s Valley Girl look for Clueless. But for our number five pick, it's got to be the 50s. Albert Wolski's black leather and hot pink from Greece. Hey, so I got a surprise for you. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> For a movie about being hip and cool, Grease certainly nails it. From Danny's slick back leather and a t-shirt, thank you Marlon Brando, to Sandy's virginal white pastel skirts and dresses, to every Rizzo and Kinnicky in between. And Olivia Newton-John's final transformation? Yes, please. But what of the beautiful women in stunning dresses we haven't mentioned yet? We saved them for our number four. There's Moulin Rouge, a Dolce Vita, and Pretty Woman. There's the breathtaking green dress from Atonement and the beautiful yellow one from How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Because sometimes it only takes one to turn heads. But if there's a single dress that stands out in Hollywood fashion history more than any other, it's Marilyn Monroe's from The Seven Year Itch. Oh, she's got the grease on the same one. The gracious. The light ivory cocktail dress has been carved into the fashion history book. It was designed by William Trevia, or was it just bought off the rack? Did the immodesty of the scene lead to Marilyn's divorce? Was she having an affair with the designer? Rumors of Marilyn and the dress abound, but regardless of what's fact or fiction, the truth remains, it was one hell of a dress. Of course, men get to dress up too, and if you've noticed a serious lack of haberdashery on this list, well, that's because we've been saving it for our number three. And with so many choices, there's a lot to love. A Hard Day's Night, North by Northwest, Reservoir Dogs, A Single Man, Top Hat, Kingsman, and don't forget pretty much every Bond film ever. And we've got to give an honorable shout out to Gold Rush for Charlie Chaplin's debut of the sloppy be suited tramp. However, for our number three, there's nothing quite like the Vegas excess from Marty Scorsese's Casino. Before I ever ran a casino or got myself blown up, Ace Rothstein was a hell of a hand. That's right. And while designer Rita Ryak deserves lots of credit for her 30-plus lavish looks for Sharon Stone's Ginger, she really clinches this spot with her 70 costumes for De Niro, all handmade, including 45 custom suits. Her bespoke vintage sartorial digs perfectly track his rise, payday, and eventual fall. Sure, they're gaudy and excessive and pretty hideous by today's standards, but this was suiting for the 70s, and for that, it was perfect. Now there's style, and then there's fashion. And that's where our number two comes in, because there are some films that have perfectly captured the look a la mode, either because they were about it, like The Devil Wears Prada and Coco before Chanel, or because they pretty much built it, like Breakfast. But if there's any film that was on the bleeding edge of fashion, it's Breakfast and Tiffany. And that's thanks to the dynamic duo made up of Givenchy and Edith Head. Don't you just love it? Love what? Tiffany! Now, maybe you've heard of Givenchy, but who's Edith Head, you ask naively? Only the most badass costume designer ever, nominee for 35 Academy Awards, winner of eight, pretty much a fashion legend, and also, does she not look a little familiar? It's a horrible suit, darling. Oh, you can't be seen in it. That would allow it. The look of Breakfast at Tiffany's is unforgettable, and it's largely thanks to Givenchy and Edith's marvelous fashion. Now, we've seen the past, the future, and everything in between, but for our number one, we've saved ourselves for fashion's wildest landscape, fantasy. So, what do we got? 
well, there's the entire Peter Jackson slash Tolkien universe, and then there's Enchanted, Alice in Wonderland, and Edward Scissorhands, too. We really love the uber-stylized imagination of the costumes from Tarsim Singh's The Fall, as well as his freshman effort, The Cell, along with pretty much everything Terry Gilliam has ever designed. And what about superhero movies? Those are fantasy, too, and as far as they go, we love the latest incarnations of Spider-Man, Iron Man, and especially Circa the Dark Knight Batman. He can finally turn his head! But if we're talking fantasy, there's nothing more memorable, more quick essential, more perfectly designed than the wardrobes from the Wizard of Oz. Hello? The birth of the costume industry, makeup Even industry, and hairstyle industry all start here. Place. Is there one piece of Hollywood clothing more iconic? The entire wardrobe was designed by Adrian, that's right, he just goes by Adrian, one of the golden age of Hollywood's most famous designers. And what could possibly be better than the Cowardly Lion's fur, the Tin Man's silver funnel, the Scarecrow's burlap sack, the Wicked Witch's pointy hat, and Dorothy's blue pinafore. We can't think of anything, which is why we think this is the best movie wardrobe of all time. So, what do you think? Did we leave out one of your favorite movie wardrobes? Do you disagree with one of our picks? Do you have any ideas for future top 10 lists? Let us know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe. So today, one of the challenges that we have is that we need to discuss and have a conversation on which is more impressive when we're looking at makeup, style, and setting. Is it more impressive to perfectly imitate another historical time period, which they did actually in your top 10 mojo video, or to create your own convincing fantasy world? It's almost not fair to have that comparison. And yet every year in film, these are what are against one another. Generally, it's a Hollywood period piece versus a sci-fi. And so to have you look through those, oops, I'm actually going to show you two clips later on that deal with these particular films. You know, would you vote for Mad Max Beyond Fury Road or Titanic? They are radically different. They are meant to radically look um, different. They're meant to actually transport you into the world. But when we compare those two, they're almost two different categories, yet Hollywood only has one costume category. Now, as we think about it, we need to think about how you actually evaluate costume. So these are from your book as well. And probably the most famous one of all time is, of course, the Marilyn Monroe seven-year itch white kind of cocktail party dress that shows up. If I move myself over here by the shoes, there we go. When we are evaluating costume, this is what we look at. We look at, is it an accurate, so for realism, is it an accurate construction of what we're expected to see? Is it, um, if it is, why is it? If it's not, why is it not? Is it meant to show fantasy and wit? What is it about it? What about the class? What is the apparent income level of the person? And note, there's why for each one. This is one of the things you'll be doing as your analysis for your discussion board this week. The sex, is it feminine, masculine, gender bending, indiscriminate, why? The age of the actor. Is it appropriate clothing for the age? Why or why not? The silhouette. Is costume four-fitting or loose and baggy and why? The fabric. Is the material coarse, sturdy, plain, sheer, and or delicate and why? Accessories. Jewelry, hat, weapons. What they tell you, the audience about the character. Why? Color symbolism. Is it hot? Is it cool? Is it subdued? Is it bright? Solid? Patterns? Um, is it natural? Elements that show up and why? Function. Is the costume meant for leisure or for work? Is it meant to impress by its beauty and splendor? Or is it merely utilitarian and why? And finally, image. What is the overall impression that costume creates? Is it sexy, constricting, boring, gaudy, conventional, eccentric, prim, cheap looking, elegant, and why? So if we just look at the Marilyn Monroe construction that here, um, that over here, this looks like a time period somewhere in about the 1950s, early 1960s, we placed that dress. Because of the cut line, we're starting to see a little bit of the breast line, a fair amount of skin that's coming up. So we know it's not going to be much earlier. Um, and so it's kind of women's liberation a little bit. It's fun and exciting. The class, this is a woman who's in the middle class. Um, this is not an upper class dress. You can look, there's, there's not all sorts of uh, um, fancy jewels. There's not, it's not be jeweled. It's not be studded. So this is an upper middle class or middle class dress. The sex, it's clearly feminine. It's meant to show the silhouette and the beauty for the most beautiful women in the world. And the age of the actor or actress in this, she's in her mid-20s, maybe as old as early 30s if she's in fairly good shape. She's meant to be seen as a sex symbol. That's flirty, though, with that high voice, oh, I didn't know it was going to fly up, as she walks over a subway grate. Trust me, any woman in New York knows what happens when you walk over a subway grate. The accessories, note, there's very little jewelry. We have a little bit on the earlobe. 
but nothing blocking the neckline, which helps the plunging neckline well into our breast line that shows up here. Um, color symbolism, the idea here. Oh, I'm sorry, let's go with fabric. It's here, of course, sturdy, plain, sheer, or it's delicate. It actually is so delicate, it can fly up with a little mist. Uh, and she does have on the undergarment, so it's not completely risque. Um, the color symbol, it's white. White is about cool, calm, collected, but it's also about purity. And so even though we're showing some skin here, she's got that knockoff, almost like she's a younger girl that basically hasn't been touched. She's got virginal purity written all over it. The function, this is a party dress that's meant to go out for leisure. She's not going out to work in this. It appears she's on a date as it flies up and the guy next to her looks over like very sexualized about it. And finally, so it's a fun, playful 25 to 30 year old woman out on a date in this flirtatious manner as she walks over the subway grade. That's how we evaluate fashion. And that's what you'll be doing actually as you move forward. No, we can do the same thing with Indiana Jones from last um, for, from the Last Crusade or from Temple of Doom or from Raiders of the Lost Ark. We have the archaeologist by day and the badass archaeologist at night um, out with his whip and his hat. Now, some of the top 25 costumes that have ever been done of all time, one of them, of course, is going to be number 25, generally comes in. And so here's a different list. The Devil Wears Prada. This is the most expensively costumed film ever to date that cost well over a million dollars to costume, just for the costumes. We have Morocco. Um, here we actually have the beginning of um, gender bending that's actually going to start off. Really, you have this, this woman who literally is dressed up and much more of a masculine and giving off a masculine vibe, even in terms of the way they lean over. The Wild One, supposedly this was designed by Marlon Brando to show that bad boy leather that we see in biker gangs and things all the way down to the day. Silence of the Lambs, this idea of this individual that needs to be protected or needs to be controlled in every aspect with straight jacket, even with the face. Funny Face, note one of them that's done by Edith Head, who is the most successful costume designer ever, and Edna from The Incredibles is based upon her. And so the idea of this black and white as they dance, you see the, the color symbolism, so this playful 1960s kind of look. Here's Edith Head as well, most successful costume design ever, more than 30 Academy Awards, or 30 nominations, eight wins, she's spectacular. Black Panther by Ruth Carter. And one of the things I want to tell you, I got to work with Ruth a little bit um, on Black Panther and working through it. Look at all the details that can go into a costume. So this is my perspective as a someone who worked a little bit on Black Panther. Specifically, look at all the detail that goes into it as a cultural consultant to make it accurate. Hi, I'm Ruth Carter, costume designer. First African American to win an Oscar for costume design. We're talking about the scene. We're talking about the scene where the Black Panther arrives in Wakanda after rescuing Nakia. He is greeted by his mother, the Queen Ramonda, and his sister, Shuri. Queen Mada. And then we're also talking about the warrior fall. The storytelling element has everything to do with honoring tradition, the different areas of Africa that have such a rich history and culture. So as T'Challa enters Wakanda on the landing pad, we're greeted by the Queen Ramonda. She's wearing what I call her shoulder mantle, including the Isikolo, Isikolo, which is the South African married woman hat. And when I looked at this hat, I felt like it looked like a crown, and I really wanted it to be perfectly shaped. And the only way that we could get it perfectly shaped was to have it 3D printed, along with her shoulder mantle, which is patterned from African It takes about a week to, to actually make that one. And there cool. are algorithms that are designing these beautiful lines and this beautiful lace. And then it's 3D printed with a flexible material so she can actually get it on and get it off and wear it. It's wearable art. Thank you, Nakia. It is so good to have you back with us. And then you have Shuri, who is wearing an Adinkra symbol. This Adinkra symbol means purpose. And she certainly has a purpose in Wakanda. Did he freeze? I 
American interloping midlife. <laughs> Over on your left, you see Florence Kasumba, who is one of our Dora Milaje. She is wearing silver metallic armor. Ryan Coogler really wanted all of the armor on the Dora Milaje to look like jewelry. And so we made sure that it had a brilliant shine. There's this area of the Dora Milaje that I like to call the harness. I wanted the harness to look like it was hand tooled. Hand tooled by the same special craftsman of Wakanda that would make the queen's costume because it's a great honor for someone to be a Dora Milaje. They also wear neck rings and arm rings that are from South Africa, just like the Indibele tribe. The beadwork is inspired by the Turkana tribe. So you'll see different regions of Africa. A comfort for the loss. Thank you, Nakia. It is so good to have you back with us. Take it to the river province to prepare it for the ceremony. Yes, General. Nakia is a war dog. She is a Nigerian princess. Nakia wears green. Right here, a river stone. And it's something that we wanted to include to signify her tribe and her country. She is a spy and she was undercover as a Muslim girl. And she wore a burqa type drape when she was a spy. And then she takes it off and underneath it all is her fighting costume. On the other side of T'Challa, we have Okoye, who was played by Danae Guerrera, and she is wearing gold armor. And that signifies that she is the leader of the Dora Milaje. And then in the middle, we see T'Challa. His costume here is from Captain America Civil War. He has a triangular pattern that we infuse in the suit. It's kind of like the sacred geometry of Africa. It not only makes him a superhero, it also makes him an African king. <laughs> well, you finished. Infusing African tradition with modern technology, one place we started was the 3D printing of the shoulder mantle for Queen Ramonda. Another representation is seen in Shuri. Shuri is wearing a necklace here in more of a modern kind of a choker way, but these little puka shells were used as trading. They represented wealth. Also with the Dora Milaje, anywhere where you see a silver or a metal substance, it is vibranium. And so that is a way that we actually can actually include cultural elements. And we're looking at costuming and makeup to give kind of tiny little details and hints. Now, most audience members are not gonna pick up on that, but individuals from those different cultures were basically paying homage to those cultures. And we do that over and over, um, not just in, in things such as Black Panther, but like if you were looking at Disney's Moana, where, where I also got to be a cultural consultant, or where I haven't been a cultural consultant, going back to look at Gladiator many years ago. So the top 25 costume, pretty woman, from prostitute to chic, or prostitute to kind of beautiful woman um, that shows up within um, and being kind of elegant. Breakfast at Tiffany's, number 12, designer Hubert de Givenchy and Edith Head together that jointly won the Academy Award. That's basically set the style uh, for 1960s fashion with the cocktail dress. The Batman, when they made the joke even that he can now move his neck within the process from Batman Begins and then later on from Dark Knight. The Star Wars costume. Uh, I would actually even give the shout out before the Star Wars costume um, higher would be the Blade Runner costume, which is takes Star Wars to the next level. Blade Runner here in 1982 which is a remarkable because you get to play around with all the different styles of people around the galaxy. LGBTQ community is actually raising up, fur, anti-fur, metallic. So you get to play with all those different elements. Vertigo by Edith Head. Again, another Academy Award for Edith Head. Here you see that costume that shows up. The Gold Rush, Charlie Chaplin, where he sells this loose fitting, but it's supposed to be Dapper Dan, loose-fitting, um, impoverished man of the town. And probably many people would put Titanic number one. Not everyone, but as a period piece, it is spectacular for the hundreds of columns. So what do you think is the most important and best costume design of all time? I leave that to you, and that's the drum roll. And almost everyone puts it in at number one, the Wizard of Oz. It is the place where costuming literally did begin as an industry, makeup, as well as kind of very high lit settings. And so last time we also looked at 
the Academy Award for things like hairstyling and the transformation that happens in American Werewolf in London. Now, as the, along with costume, we can also use makeup to create a style. And we basically ask the exact same questions. How does the makeup here with all these different functions get us to believe that Johnny Depp and what do we believe about Johnny Depp as Edward Scissorhands hands here? So you see there's numerous scars, but they've healed. So that means he used to have no control. He's got more control now. Wild hair, he's not cutting his own hair. So he kind of lives on the fringe or the outside. Very pasty, means he doesn't go outside very much. He's got clothes on, and note they don't have tears or rips. So he must have a way of actually getting the scissor hands in within it. So he's kind of this ostracized, lone, never outside, probably lonely individual with that pale skin. And that's what we're reading when we look at Edward Scissorhands. Now, there are different aspects we can use for makeup. One is we can use makeup to make a point. So we have here Jeff Goldblum in The Fly from 1986, remarkable transformation, kind of like based upon the idea of a werewolf in London on how you transform a body. But he goes from being a fairly good looking, normal New York individual to looking like this hideous monster. So it, the outside appearance slowly becomes basically what his insides are for his very dark art. He becomes very animalistic in the process. We have makeup as a plot device. And so in this case, in Tootsie and later on Robin Williams in um, Mrs. Doubtfire, we have women dressing up as men to be closer with their families, or in this case, to have a, a job. So here's the transformation. It took many hours every day for Robin Williams to come in and become Mrs. Doubtfire. Sometimes the actors have to be there and will actually sleep during it, but it can take four or five hours depending upon what they have to put on. Prosthetics versus manipulations with CGI. Remember, this was mostly done before CGI, computer-generated imagery. Remember, there are scenes where they have to go back and forth and have only half of the makeup on, so they've got to figure all of that out. And these costumes that can be very heavy and very hot, early on they were highly toxic because we didn't know all the negative chemicals that are carcinogens that we would be putting on including such things going all the way back to Wizard of Oz. The Tin Man had a reaction to the tin and the makeup that was putting on him, that he actually developed a rash. The first Tin Man actually had to quit before they started filming. So sometimes it's used for a transformation. Another thing we use makeup for sometimes, and costumes, is the idea of just making something new, right? We're gonna bring you to a new world that you've never seen before, like we have in the Yellow Brick Road in the Wizard of Oz. So you literally can be used to make something new. You can make it actually to be believable with the help of makeup. For example, the feet. There were more than a thousand pairs of feet that they went through in the Lord of the Rings trilogy from 2001 to 2003. They kept wearing out. We didn't have CGI. Also, we can use makeup as a shock device. The idea that you showed the destruction of the human body that snaps apart and you're looking inside the brain cavity of the skull or as people eat in um, Day of the Dead. So we can actually use shock devices. And again, makeup to transform actors into animals, such as Roddy McDowell, that actually became one of the apes in Planet of the Apes. The, the makeup was so real that the horses were freaked out that it was no longer a man. And so they had great difficulty allowing the, the apes or the ape-like creatures 
to get on them, which caused all sorts of problems. Um, the makeup was so good that the, the industry and the people who actually worked on Planet of the Apes um, lobbied for the um, Academy Awards, the Oscars, to start a makeup category. And the first one that was given was given out the year after this, but this one was given an honorary um, award for best costume and makeup for what they were able to do, achieve, but push the film industry forward. So here's Rodney McDowell's own home movies about how he was created on the set of Planet of the Apes. So that's what the actor started off looking like. And you can see how long, it's pretty massive on how long it takes to convert him over. So in all of this then becomes the idea of the, pro the part of dramatization, making you and putting you in a visual world. I'm going to scan through because you see how long the videos are. Stopping in various and different stages so you can see where we're at as we're rubbing in a different color. Now today we often can manipulate this with CGI. So there's anything wrong, but we generally put on costumes as well. And then there's the hair. You know how the eyes pop now. So we're working in the hair to make sure everything is covered. We can also do makeup to transform actors into different people. So in Monster, one of the most beautiful women in the world, Charlize Theron in 2003, she was actually made to look like this murderer. I forgot the woman's name, but this murderer actually in the movie Monsters herself. So that is Charlize Theron. And we can now combine, and what we often do is combine makeup with CGI. The best example of this is the curious case of Benjamin Button, where they used Brad Pitt's model of about a 40-year-old man and worked him back all the way to make him look young and worked him forward. And they had people that they searched out that for the models that looked older and younger. And when they couldn't find someone, they used CGI to show those different stages in life. So here's the process for that. We By today's standards, 76 year old makeup, which was later used for the visual effects. And we started with that age and worked down. For this, we came up with an absolutely tissue paper thin, kind of like a membrane appliance that was so thin and put on with his wrinkles, we'd match them up in that and blend it right into his eyebrows. And with him moving it, it actually would push his wrinkles in and actually create a really nice wrinkled forehead. But too, that was, uh, it wasn't that uncomfortable. I mean, besides getting shellacked in the morning <laughs> and then getting it taken off and acid at night. But during the day itself, it was not that bad. It, it, in the end, it was, it, it was surprising one how thin it, it, it got. It could still, it could be and still, still tell the story if I tell it better. If the forehead piece was put on slightly different, at two o'clock in the morning because that's when Brad had to get into the chair. I mean, you're not talking about an eighth of an inch, you're talking about a sixteenth of an inch as this piece went on and they had registration marks and stuff and, but you know, Brad would be moving around or the or the crow's feet piece or whatever would have shifted slightly and it, it was it was uncanny how different it would make him look. The makeup suit I was I was so impressed with the detail because uh, uh, to change from seven years, there would be the pieces are, are, are so they sculpted each age, you know, that they, we wanted to portray in the film. And switching a piece out and, and then having a piece at age 67 or a piece for age 56 that they had to keep track of is so minimal, but and something you won't you'll just see the you just feel the, the gradual progression through the film because it's so um, uh, I think seamless in its transition. It's really incredible. I don't know how many different ages. 
in the end, but we had combinations of yeah. going on all the time. And it's also a, a map to keep track of. The other thing that we can do is actually as we start thinking about background and setting in costume, is look at the difference between these two wars. Here we have the, the on the very right from World War II, the cool kind of blue palette that shows up. And on the left from Platoon, the complementary colors of the greens and reds and oranges that show up, that really is a vibrant, kind of giving you the heat and how overwhelming the experience was. Even when you're spread out, you're kind of on your own, alone in your own thoughts. Here, it's you as a massive fighting force. So we can often use settings to actually go through that. So we do a set analysis. Here's what we look at. You look at the, is it exterior and interior? Why? The style, is it realistic? Is it expressionistic? Is it imaginative? Is it a completely sci-fi creation and why? Studio or location and why? Period, what era, if it does represent a period, what the period does it represent and why? What is the apparent income level of the owners and why? Size, is it massive, is it small? Um, sometimes the smaller um, settings are just as impressive as the massive settings. Decoration, how is the set furnished? Are there any status symbols? Oddities of taste and the like, like you would find in a Wes Anderson movie? Is it crowd, crowded or sparsely furnished and why? And is there a symbolic function of anything that we're seeing and why? And so that's how we evaluate the movie sets. So if we look at the, the Waterworld at all, a terrible movie with one of the greatest sets of all time, this is now a movie set that you can actually rent out and use for other movie making madness that shows up. It's a floating island. We have Batman's Gotham City, where you have complete reconstruction of four blocks. We have Cleopatra's Rome, which actually had to be recreated twice because it was too hot where they were first filming, so they had to recreate this outside of Italy as well. We had this, which fits onto a table and was reflected by mirrors. This is the original set of actually the movie Metropolis. Interesting sets. Look at the interesting aspect that shows up with, with Dogville, with Nicole Kidman, if you don't know it. It's a theater piece that's actually set up, and I'll walk through it as we look at a couple of the images that show up here. So the entire set is laid out so you can see into every building and see what everyone is doing. And so there's really, while you believe and think there are walls if you were to go down there, it really is the setup itself. So almost it eliminates the idea of privacy. If someone's having an affair, it's almost like everyone else knows that individual's having an affair and with who and for how long, even though you're trying to keep it straight secret. And so the entire set is this. We have the Lego Bricksburg for everything is awesome, which is a pretty amazing CGI, but also they actually had to make a, a full scale model in Legos of this. Hobbit Town, which is one of the places I really would love to go to in New Zealand. You can actually spend the night here. The idea of Moscow in the 1950s. It's a complete reconstruction of Moscow, which is a huge, so this is from Dow. Apollo's 13, where they actually created the inside of the castle. So sometimes it doesn't take four blocks of Gotham City. It can be intricate and small, or it's like you're trying to represent something where you spend so, so much time on your way to the moon. And of course, the underworld area. This is also a rentable aspect where you can actually go and film things underwater, and they have got the lights and everything set up for you, much cheaper than for you to do it on your own. And so when we look at those top 10 movie sets, that's what we're looking at. Um, for those of you that are doing your film, you also have the idea of location scouting. You'll go out and you'll find right, what time of day, what's the shadow, what's the lighting condition, how often does it rain, where does the light fall, is there a good place, what type of permits do I need, all the questions that you would need for location scouting. So for all of you, for your discussion board this week, you have to do a discussion board on dramatization. So you have to choose a film that has won the Academy Award for costume, makeup, or setting 
and then write on whatever it won the Academy Award on, do a thorough anal analysis of why. Pick two or three different scenes or costumes and walk about, walk through why this was that best film in that particular year for getting all the different features that show up on either costume, on makeup, or on setting. You, each person can only choose one film, so we should have, in a class, we should have 30 to 40 different films that are being argued. So once a film is taken, you'll have to choose a different film that won those. To know what won the Academy Award, there's actually a list up for you in Blackboard, or you can Google it and say Academy Award winners in costume, and we'll give you a whole list of those events as well. And that's what we're looking at. Thank you very much. Bye.